church. I want you to go with me to the Gospel of St. Luke, the 15th chapter. The Gospel of St. Luke, the 15th chapter. And normally uh, I don't read a whole passage, but I am going to read quite a few verses out of this. Uh, this. In fact, we're going to read the chapter, Luke chapter uh, 15. A few weeks ago, uh, we started talking about legacy, uh, which is a vision-driven uh, series that talks about the future of our church, the vision of our church, who we are, the DNA, our core values. Uh, I started out with how legacy has a priority and that priority is a people. We then dealt with legacy's prayer life because this needs to be a house of prayer. And then last week, I lost my mind and preached like John the Baptist come out of the wilderness or something on legacy's worship and how that worship needs to be a priority to us. And I just want to say, I'm so proud of you guys. Y'all were in here when the music started and y'all were ready to go this morning. And I believe that that is pleasing to the heart of Almighty God. I really do. And so, uh, and then I watched Wednesday night as I was in Sacramento, California, representing our church in, at a board meeting uh, for uh, colleges. I watched Wednesday night, Pastor Alex preached one of the greatest messages on worship that I think I've ever heard. When he made the point about worship levels the playing field for everybody and King David stripped down to priestly garments as if to say that when in, in the presence of God there's no little big eyes and little U's there's only people who are worshiping God passionately I'm going to tell you I was sitting in a hotel room when he did that I started weeping in the hotel room I said man that's one of the most powerful points I've ever heard about worship today I want to talk about a uh, legacy and its service and how that we're called to serve selfishly. I'm going to be preaching Wednesday night and I'm going to be coming back to this with a more detailed message Wednesday night. Wednesday night will be a Greek word study. I would encourage you to be a part of that. Come ready to learn something. Next Sunday we're going to talk about Legacies Diversity. One of the things that makes our church special is that we're a diverse church. And next week, I've got something really special in store for you on Sunday morning as we celebrate our diversity and who God's created us to be. I'm so proud to be a part of a church that represents the colors of heaven. And when we get to heaven, there's not going to be one race over the other race or one uh, class over the other class that we're all just going to be God's people. We're going to be the bride of Christ. And so next Sunday, we're going to share that and we're going to have a lot of fun as we do it. Today, I want to talk about a part of our vision that is very plain. We believe that every single individual in this place is born with gifts and talents special abilities that God has given you that enables you to serve the Lord and also serve the body of Christ. Every person in this place, listen to me, whether you feel like you deserve it or not, whether you feel capable or not, you are gifted by God for the body of Christ. You have been specifically chosen to do a task for the body of Christ and for the, the world as we know it. No matter how insignificant that talent might seem to you this morning, the scripture is very clear that everyone in this church is vitally important to the advancement of the kingdom of Almighty God, no matter how insignificant you think it is. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and I'm going to come to Luke chapter 15, just stay there. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 18 says, God has set every single person in the body of Christ as it has pleased him. In other words, when God created you and gave birth to you, and he knew that you were going to be born again, God created a place for you. The Bible describes the body of Christ as a building that has been, our body that has been fitly put together. Not everybody has the same gift and the same talent. For some of you, you might be an eye. For some, you might be a hand. For some, you might be a foot. But every single one of you are vitally important to the body of Christ, and God has created you so. Now, you're saying to me, well, Pastor, uh, I'll just be honest with you. The things that I have, I don't feel like the most gifted or talented person in the world. Well, God has an answer to that as well. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 22, the Bible says, those of you who think you're insignificant, that he says the weakest amongst us should understand that they are the most important parts of the body. Now, all you've got to do is study the physical anatomy to understand how, uh, what God means by that. If you've ever stubbed your little toe at night, 
Your little toe will control the rest of your body. Now, some of y'all are like me. You say, man, that's an ugly little toe. And uh, man, that little toe sure doesn't look like that it serves, serves much of a purpose. But did you know that if I were to cut your little toe off, you'd have to learn how to walk again? Because it, 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 it gives so much. Just same thing with your hand. Many people think that this small finger here is so insignificant, but all of the grip force that you have in your hand comes from those bottom two fingers. What I'm trying to tell you today, that all of us are gifted and talented. So today as I, serve, uh, as I speak about serving the Lord and serving the church with the gifts that God has given you, I want to choose to assume that every single born again believer in this house, everyone who is saved and filled with the Spirit of God has a desire to do something for God. They might not know what they want to do, but they have a desire to do something. Something. So with that said, I want to read to you one passage of scripture that the Lord's been talking to me from a different angle on, and it's Luke chapter 15. If you've been in church any time at all, you've heard this, but I want to hit it from a different angle. Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him, and the Pharisees and the scribes complained, saying, this man receives sinners and he eats with them. So he spoke a parable to them, and actually he spoke three saying, what man of you having a hundred sheep, if he loses one, does not leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he found it? And when he's found it and he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing, and when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors saying to them, rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say to you that likewise, there'll be more joy in heaven over one sinner that repents than over the 99 just persons who need no repentance. Verse number eight, what woman having 10 silver coins? Notice this is a woman. She has how many silver coins? Ten. All right, she has 10. That's very important to the text. If she loses one coin and does not light a lamp, sweeps the house and search carefully until she finds it. And when she has found it, she calls her friends and her neighbors together and says, rejoice with me for I have found a piece which was lost. Likewise, I say to you, there'll be joy in the presence of the angels uh, over God, uh, of God over one sinner who repents. Then he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of good that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a famine, a severe famine in the land, and he began to be in want. And then he went and he joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed the swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father's house and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion on him and ran and fell on his neck. I love this right here. I've got to be honest with you. And he kissed him. And his son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I'm no longer the worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring the best robe. Aren't you glad that when you've messed up royally, the God in heaven is a good father that says, bring the best and let's reestablish you as a son in the father's house. He said, bring the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand, sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he is found and they began to be merry. Now notice the turn in the story. Now his older son who was in the field as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of his servants and asked what these things meant. So he said to him, your brother has come and because he was re I've received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry and he would not go in. Therefore, his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, lo, these many years I've been serving you. I've never transgressed your commandment at any time, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make mayor with my friends. But as soon as this, your son, has come, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, son, you're always with me and all that I have is already yours. 
It was right that we should make merry and be glad for your brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is now found. I want you to pray with me that the Lord will help me deliver this this morning. Holy Spirit, I pray right now you would come upon me, that you would anoint me as the man of God of this house to share the hearts and the mind of God. Lord, let what I say today be exactly what you would speak as if you're standing here on the platform yourself. Speak to our hearts today in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. This morning, I want to talk about a part of our vision that God has called us to serve, not only to serve our church, but to serve in the positions and the anointings that he's called us to in this earth. Now, I could preach a lot out of Luke chapter 15. In fact, one of my difficulties this morning is going to be to stay on task with what God wants me to say today. Today, I want to take Luke, Luke 15, and I'm not, I'm not want to, I don't want to talk about how to serve I want to talk about the heart behind serving. I believe everybody in here wants to serve God in some capacity in the earth. You want to make a difference, don't you? Want to make a difference for God before you leave this planet? I believe everybody has a desire to do that. I think where we all get messed up is in our heart of service. Sometimes I think our heart gets a little bent out of shape when we uh, think about serving God. And I think it really hurts what we do for the Lord. So to do that today, I want to talk about three things. First of all, I want to talk about the context of this story. I want you to notice here in Luke chapter 15, verse number one, the Bible says all the tax collectors and all the sinners drew near to him. And then there were some Pharisees and some scribes who also came to him and they were upset because Jesus was eating with sinners. You see, Jesus and his disciples were passing through this area in your Bible that's called Perea, and they were on their way toward Jerusalem for the final feast, the Passover feast, which was held each spring to celebrate the redemption of the Jews from Egypt uh, for over 1,500 years earlier. But the Jews of Jesus' time did not realize one important thing, that Jesus was the Lamb of God who was coming to take away the sin of the world. He was heading toward the cross of Calvary, in order to offer redemption for both Jews and Gentiles. And the religious Jews of Jesus' day did not really understand that. So as Jesus was making his way to go die as a lamb, being led to the slaughter upon a cruel cross for you and I, for the sin of the whole world, the Bible says that sinners were drawn to him that tax collectors and publicans. Now, tax collectors weren't like tax collectors today. I know we're coming into tax time. We're thinking about tax collectors, but these weren't the tax collectors, the IRS of our day. These were extortionists. These were very mean, brutal people, and they were not official servants of the government. They were hired private entrepreneurs who made their money by literally overcharging and extorting families as they were coming in and out of cities and across borders, and they had gained a terrible reputation that was really quite deserved of being uh, venal exploiters and amassers of slush funds and spies for the Roman government. These were mean people. So you can understand how that whenever they come to Jesus and they want to sit down with him and Jesus receives them, that the religious of the day, the church people of the day say, man, I tell you what, this is something else. He should not be eating with these sinners at all. So what I want you to notice, first of all, in in verse number one and verse number two of chapter 15, notice there are two groups of people. There are sinners and then there's scribes. One is completely lost without God. Another one claims to know God and have the heart of God. And they are at odds with with each other. So this is the context of the story. Now that you've got the context of the story, I want to deal with the content of the story. Notice in Luke chapter 15, verses 4 through verse number 32, Jesus gives us the content of the story on the heels of this context. The context is very, very important to understand this. I've never read this passage of scripture, Brother Mike, like I'm reading it in this light. But when you read it with this context, I want to show you that Jesus, through the whole chapter, from the rest of the chapter, is only dealing with two people. People who are supposed to be right with God 
and have the heart of God and be serving God from that perspective. And people who are totally lost and don't know anything about God who he has come to rescue. Notice there are three stories that he uses to deal with the content uh, of what he wants to share. First of all is the parable of the lost sheep. Verses 4 through 7, Jesus starts out and says, imagine a man who has a hundred sheep. He's a shepherd. Ninety-nine follow the shepherd, but one wanders off and he gets lost. He said, would not that shepherd go and do anything that he could do to find that one lost sheep? And then he says, when he has found him, he brings him back on his shoulders and he celebrates because this one was lost, is now found. And he makes this statement that Jesus gets more excited over one sinner who gives their life to, to, to the Lord Jesus than over the 99 who are constantly serving the Lord and following the Lord. In other words, I just hate to break this to you. Jesus is excited and possibly potentially, ladies and gentlemen, could be more excited about the sinner out there that he's after than he is over just our gathering together as a church. And I think it's important that we keep that heart. Our church is a church that serves because we believe that there is a lost and dying generation that Jesus gave his life for that needs to be re reconciled to God. That's the reason I serve in my church. That's the reason I serve out there in the world is because I want the lost world to see the love of a God who would do anything to find them. So notice, first of all, he has the lost sheep. But then he comes to this story of the lost coin. Now, this is the first in the circumstance of the lost coin. The coin that is referred to here in this passage is a piece of silver uh, worth in our money approximately 16 cents. It's not like it's a valuable coin, not even in Jesus' day was it a valuable coin in the aspect of it was worth a lot of money. And the Bible says that this lady had 10 of these. Now I have preached this for years that notice she has 10 coins. Everybody say 10. She loses one, so notice she loses her tithe. So she's running and she's scouring a house to try to find her tithe because she knows that that belongs to God. And I think you could reach in there and grab it. But this last week I was doing a little bit of research and I found something I've never seen before. In the Judaica Encyclopedia, it tells you that one of the main uh, uh, practices of a young Jewish lady, whenever she would get married, is she would take 10 coins. She would sew these 10 coins into a beautiful headdress. I know that you guys have seen people in the Middle East and they're, they're getting married and you can see these coins in their headdress. Well, these are the coins that Jesus was talking about. So notice now he's talking about a woman who has 10 coins. These 10 coins are basically her dowry. It is the prized possession that she has to offer her husband. And what she would do is she would intricately create this headdress, but now she, in the process of working on this headdress, which speaks to her husband that I'm giving you everything that I have in life, she loses one of the piece of coin. Nine is not good enough because nine is short of complete. And so she's got to find the one coin so that she can uh, show her husband that she wants to give everything that she has. So the Bible says she sweeps the house. She does everything that she can to, oh, to recover this lost coin and she finds it. And she goes to rejoicing that she found this coin. Basically, in the first parable, it's dealing with the lost outside the house. In the second parable, it's dealing with something that is lost inside the house. Notice what I'm trying to show you. The first parable deals with a sheep that wandered off. But the second parable deals with a coin that was lost through neglect. One wandered away and left God or was outside of a relationship with God, outside of the sheep pen. One was in the house, but it was still lost through neglect. This is the content, and this is the context of the story. So notice now we come to the story of the prodigal son. The prodigal son happens to be about, come on now, everybody hold up two fingers. It happens to be about 
two brothers, a young brother and an older brother. And a young brother is in the house and says, Father, give me the inheritance that belongs to me. And then the Bible says this younger brother takes his inheritance, goes to a far country, and there he wastes his living or wastes his inheritance with riotous living. Notice it does not say that he wasted it with harlots. It was the older brother who said he wasted it with harlots. There's some animosity between the younger and the older brother. So the younger brother goes off and he, he gets lost. He is out there outside of the father's house. He is out there in the world. And he gets so tied up, he hooks up in the wrong relationship. And the next thing you know, he is eating and feeding the swine in the pig uh, pen. So here's a Jew who is lost outside of God's pig, outside of God's uh, sheep pen, and now he is in a pig pen. A Jew and pigs don't go together, right? So you see how lost that he is. But the older brother stayed in the father's house. The older brother went and worked in the field. The older brother still honored the father. Now, when Jesus was telling this story, you need to understand this. When he's telling the story, the, the people who are listening, specifically the scribes and Pharisees, have to be freaking out. Because in their mind, if a young man walked out, first of all, if he asked for his inheritance early, he was worse than the scum of the earth. If he left his father and went and wasted his inheritance, he's even worse than the worst of the scum of the earth. And if he ever tried to come and reunite with his father, the townspeople would stone him dead. He was worthy to be stoned dead. It was so disrespectful to the father. So here you have this young man who's out there in a pig pen and here you have an older brother. He's honoring the father. He's in the father's house. He loves the father. He's taking care of the father's sheep. And so the young man finally comes to his senses and he realizes here I am living with the pigs. I could at least go be a servant in my father's house. And he makes his way back to the father. I love this picture. This is such a beautiful picture of God. This ought to make you, I'm telling you every time I think about this, it makes me just want to weep. Here is the picture of the father and he gets word no doubt one of the townspeople saw him coming and they run to the father's house said that old nasty younger son of yours we go he gonna get what he deserves and he overhears that that, that his younger son is coming he gets dressed he runs out on the porch this is the way I see it and you can preach it however you want to preach it when you're preaching he runs out on the porch he looks and he sees a little speck coming up the road he realizes it's his son he takes off running with all of his love and admiration and he just runs to the sun. It is a beautiful picture of what God did for you and me when we were lost and dying and undone and we didn't deserve it. But God loved us so much that he would run to us. And so God takes off running. Here's this father runs down the road and I can just see him. He's crying. I mean, he is sobbing. He, it's like a child he thought was dead is now alive and he runs to the younger son and he falls on his neck and he starts kissing him. Yes. Now normally the younger son would kiss the father. That is the greeting, the proper greeting. The younger son would come and in honor kiss the father. That's not what he does. He kisses the son. He falls on his neck and starts kissing him. No doubt he tells the people who have stones in their hands, you put your stones down. We're not killing my son today. For this my son was lost and now he's been found. And he turns around and in great joy he says, go get a robe and put it on him. Take these old nasty pig pen clothes off of him. Put that robe of righteousness on him. Give him new shoes and give him my ring that he can buy and sell and there's so much I could preach right here. I want to preach it, but I can't today. And he says, I just want to restore him for he was, he was dead. Now he's alive. He was lost and now he is found. And so I can almost see them hand in hand, arm in arm, coming up the road, coming up into that beautiful house. Here's the family. They're all loving each other, kissing each other. He says, go get a band. We got to have some music. Everybody killed the fatty calf. We got to have some food here. And they're all out there celebrating. And the Bible says the older son comes out of the field. He's been taking care of the father's stuff. 
Notice one is outside of the house, one is inside the house. One is outside the family, one is inside the family. One wandered off, one is lost in the house through neglect. And so here comes the older brother. The older brother, as he's approaching, he hears music. Ding, 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 ding. All right. And he hears music. And they're all dancing and celebrating. And the Bible says he can hear the sound of dancing. Now, you know you're having a party when you can hear them doing the electric slide, right? You know, you know you're having a party, right? That's a party when everybody's doing the electric slide. Hey, oh, y'all didn't know Pastor go. Oh. You know you're having a party when you can hear the electric slide going on. Everybody is dancing and they're celebrating. And listen to what the older son says. The Bible says the older son gets angry. And the father comes out and he says, son, come in and have a party with us for your brother. Notice now, not my son, but your brother. This is all about relation. Your brother who was lost has been found. He who was dead is now alive. And the older brother gets mad and he makes a statement unto the father. And I want you to go back with me to Luke chapter 15. And I want to go back over here to about verse number 26. So he called one of his servants and he asked him, this is the older brother talking. Now and he says, What are these? What is going on? Basically, is what he said. And in verse 27, he said to him, Your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry, he would not go in. Therefore, his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years. Listen to the, the, the older brother. Notice how did this story start with sinners, church people. Are you with me? Lost sheep, wandered off, lost coin in the house. Two brothers, one wanders off, one stays in the father's house. The lost sheep has been found, but the older brother doesn't appreciate what he has in the father's house. One rediscovers his sonship, and one never realizes that he's really a son. So the older brother, look at this, look at how he said, he answered and said to his father, lo, these many years I've been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. Basically, the younger brother said, I've been faithful in church. I've been faithful to the things of God. I've been faithful to you. I've never done any major sin at all, and yet you've never given me a young goat. You've never thrown a party for me. And I, I love what the word says right here. And verse 30, it says, but as soon as this, your son comes, not my brother. Notice how accusatory he is who devoured your livelihood with harlots. He didn't ever see who is, what his son did. The Bible says he just made unwise investments. He wasted with righteous living. The Greek word there, he's, he made unwise investments. You can be a businessman, never commit sin and invest in the wrong thing and lose everything that you have. He says, but as soon as he came, you killed the fatted calf in him. And he said, son, this is the father. Everybody listen now. Listen to the father's heart. Son, you're always with me. And all that I have is yours. If you go back to the beginning of this passage, when the younger son asked for his inheritance, the Bible says the father divided unto them his living. You see, it was traditional that if a father divided his inheritance to one son, he had to go ahead and divide it all. So what he did is the younger son got the minor portion of the inheritance. The older son got the major portion. So whenever the younger son came and said, Father, I want my inheritance, he said, I'm going to give it to you. But when he gave it to the younger son, he also gave the major portion to the older son. So the older son got more than the younger son. So here now is the younger son who's back. So when he makes this statement and said, you never gave me anything. You've never been good to me. You've never helped me. Here's what the father says. Father, or the father says, son, you're a son in my house. You're not a slave in my house. Everything that I have belongs to you. I've already given you everything I have. If you wanted to have a party, you didn't need my permission to have a party. You're in the Father's house, and I've already given you everything that I have. See, I've seen this play out over and over again through the years where a sinner in our community would get saved, 
and God would rejoice over those sinners, but then church people wouldn't be near as excited as God is about those sinners getting saved. And it's almost like church people have an attitude. Sometimes God will take a filthy, rotten, dirty sinner off the streets, save them, take them out of a homeless situation, and the next thing you know, they've got a business, they're flourishing, and God's blessing their life. And in the same church, there's an older brother mentality that says, I've been serving God all my life. I've been paying my ties all my life. Why hasn't God been good to me? The truth of the matter is you've allowed the house to blind the goodness of God to you. Religion has blinded the idea that you are a son and he's a good father. Because I want to tell you something in here, whether you've been lost and you're just now coming to Jesus or whether you've been church all your life, he's a good daddy. He's throwing a party for everybody. You can jump in on that. And I'm glad that I got a good father. So notice the elder son has an attitude. So what I want to do now is I want to conclude by dealing with the attitude. Because the elder son was in the father's house serving the Lord. Everybody say he was serving the Lord. But he didn't have the right heart. Listen, our serving Jesus in whatever capacity that he's called us to is not about what we do. It's really more about why we do it. We got to have the right heart as we serve the Lord. Today, in just a moment, I'm going to talk to you about some ministries that need help. I need people in here to get signed up and serve the Lord. You need to find what God has called you to do. But we need to have the right heart as we do it. Because I believe when we get to heaven, Jesus ain't going to just reward us for what we do. He's going to judge our motives as well. So whether it's serving somebody out there in the homeless community and you're feeding them at the homeless shelter or whether it's serving right here in this church, whatever it is in any capacity, we got to have the right heart and that's what pleases God by serving people and serving Him. Let me look at some of the attitudes that I want to warn you about as church people when it comes to serving God. And I'm going to be very brief with these so I'm going to have to run real quick. Number one, the attitude of anger. Do you know how many church people are just mad? Isn't it it weird that church people can be just some of the nastiest people on the planet? Just angry. Here, look at this. How is it possible for the older brother to be in the father's house to have all of his inheritance and be mad at the father? How is it possible for the older brother to have the same good God gift to him and yet he be mad at his brother? You see, when God calls us to serve, God invites us to put away anger. And actually, listen to this, the word anger here literally means uncontrolled rage. This Christian had a problem with uncontrolled rage. Mad. Angry. Is it possible to serve God and not have the right attitude? Absolutely. It is possible to serve God in our heart, not really be in it. So today, I want to encourage you that we have to put aside the anger. You're going to have plenty, ample opportunity to get mad at some of your younger brothers and sisters. Not everybody is as perfect a Christian as you. Everybody slap your neighbor and say, I know he's talking about you. He can't be talking about me right now. So not everybody's going to be a perfect Christian like you, which means there are going to be some people in the house who are going to get on your nerves. But you know what we're going to do? We're going to serve them with the love of Jesus Christ. We're going to serve them with the attitude, hey, God loved me and rescued me, and God is still working on you. We've got to get rid of the attitude of anger. What about this attitude, the attitude of unfairness? In verse number 29, he says, "Uh, Father, these years I've been serving you and I've never transgressed you at any time. Listen to what he's saying. He's saying, this is unfair. This is unfair. You're throwing a party for my brother and this is completely unfair. What he's saying was, I've been serving you in your house and I feel like I'm being ignored. I feel like I've been forgotten. I've been doing all of this work in your house and you've disregarded it. I I don't even feel like you've even rewarded me for what I'm doing in the house. Listen to me, I wanna ask you a question. When you serve the Lord, are you looking for a reward from man? Are you looking on a pat of the back from the platform? Are you looking for your name on the screen? 
Are you looking for some big ministry position? Do we have the attitude of unfairness? See, many times, here's what happens. The devil plays with us. We're in the Father's house. We've got a good God, but we go to serving the Lord, and then people don't acknowledge us, and we just say, you know what? It's unfair. It's unfair. They didn't acknowledge me. They didn't talk about me. Listen, we don't do what we do for man. We do what we do for God. And I got news for you. Whatever you do in secret, God always rewards you openly. You might not get the acknowledgement from the platform, but you've got the acknowledgement from the throne. And the acknowledgement from the throne is more important. Number three, the attitude of slavery. Look at this in verse 29. He said, I've served you. I've served you. Here it's the Greek word, which is better interpret, interpreted slave. It's an attitude that feels the need to work out of obligation instead of passion. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. He was in the father's house, but he forgot he was a son. Amen. He saw himself as a slave. Look at me, folks. We're not slaves. We don't do what we do. Whatever it is that God's called us to do, whatever position God's put us in the body of Christ, we don't do it out of an obligation. We do it out of a passion of worship for the King of kings and the Lord of lords. I am not a slave. I'm a son. I'm a son in the Father's house. So we don't do what we do as an attitude of slavery. You're not just doing this because it needs to be done we're doing it because we're sons. Let me give you the next attitude that we deal with is the attitude of pride. Notice verse 29. He said, I never transgressed you at any time. Now, I, got, I, I find that hard to believe. That the older son never committed any sin. That the older son never did anything to make daddy mad. Right? That's not true. But look, his arrogance had caused him to see himself better than everybody else. He even, he never stated it, but he saw himself better than even the father himself. An attitude of pride. Listen to me, as we serve the Lord in whatever capacity that God has called us to do, this is the DNA of our church. We are servants. We serve the Lord. We serve our church. We serve our community. We're not going to come at it from an arrogant attitude that I'm better than somebody else. Because in the kingdom, there's no big eyes and little U's. In the kingdoms, there's just his people. We have a tendency that many times we think that we're better than other people just because of how they looked or what background they came from. And I'm telling you, I don't care if it's a sheep that has wandered way outside the pen or if it's a lost coin in the house. We're all the same to God. We're all sinners that have been saved by his grace. So nobody should have an attitude of pride. <laughs> Pastor Chad, come. Let me give you the next attitude, the attitude of content. Notice it wasn't now that this my brother has come, but now this your son. You see, when you and I feel rejected, when we feel like we've been ignored, when we feel like our service hasn't mattered to people and we forget that we're not doing it for people, we're doing it for God, we tend to have a contempt for those who are being acknowledged. We need to learn how to celebrate each other. Come on, we need to learn how to celebrate each other. If somebody's got a ministry and it's touching people, don't say, well, I should be doing a ministry. Why don't you say, thank God that that ministry is winning the lost and helping those who are broken and destitute. And this is the last one. This is probably the biggest one. This is the number one thing that gets in the way of us serving the king is an attitude of selfishness. I want you to notice what he was mad over. When he came and said, soon as your son has come, you kill the fatted calf. What was he mad over? The killing of the fatted calf. Now, if you go back to the first of the story, the Bible says a young son came and asked for his inheritance. And it said when he did, he delivered unto them. Everybody say them. So the older and the younger got everything the father had at the same time. The father didn't have anything. And whenever a father did this in biblical days, he was allowed to live there in that property and be taken care of as if he owned it. But he didn't own anything. So if he didn't own anything, when he killed the fatted calf for the older son, whose calf did he kill? He took the older brother's fatted calf. 
You see, the father's heart was, I know that the older brother's going to be so excited about his brother. Go get the fatted calf out of the older brother's pen. See, the father didn't have any calves. He'd give them all away. The reason the, the older brother was mad is because it was his calf the father got to kill to celebrate the younger son. Basically, the elder son didn't have a problem with rings because that didn't belong to him. He didn't have a problem with shoes because that didn't belong to him. He didn't have a problem with the younger brother getting a coat. That didn't belong to him. But when the father said, I'm going to take something that belongs over here and give it to somebody over here, the attitude of selfishness arose in his heart. I'm going to tell you, I have seen this over and over again in 29 years of pastoral ministry where God has taken a fatted calf in the house and killed it to celebrate somebody else. And people get so upset. We become territorial. Well, this is my ministry and that's my ministry and I do this and this is what I do. And really, in truth, it's not any of ours. We're just here as servants to the great King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We've got to release our selfishness. This isn't about us, folks. And I'm going to tell you, this isn't even about our church. This is about the king. This is about honoring him.